The crimes Americans, and in some cases the world, remembers in infamy were not random acts of people gone mad. What if you could show that evil isn't chaotic and random, but in some cases, it's organized? What if evil were institutionalized? What if your government was creating killers and releasing them into society? A dive into the dark minds of serial killers reveals a staggering majority were unwitting participants of MKUltra and other government projects. Making the emotional connection between these projects and the real world is extremely important. This impacts reality. Since 1960, 135 serial killers have wreaked havoc in America, while the rest of the world produced only 45. In America, there are two main forms of media spotlights, celebrities and murderers. And in the media machine, these two are often the same. I don't like this word, but I'm kind of a celebrity. We can see this in what content people choose to consume entertainment via celebrities, or entertainment via true crime. This genre has always been popular, but it has recently become more popular than ever. Fame, or infamy, works both ways, being loved by the public or reviled by the public. Either way, the outcome is immortalization in the minds of millions. Hi everyone, it's Alexandra. This is the fourth episode in the programmed series. If you haven't watched the previous videos, please do so before continuing. We've already uncovered the origins of MKUltra and the CIA. Now we're going to focus on some of the results of those experiments. Serial Killers Please note, I will not show any graphic content, but the discussion of crimes can be upsetting to some. However, to understand the magnitude of the implications of mind control, the subject cannot be ignored. American journalist David McGowan states that the lone gunman theory, or the idea that mass murders are random, is just a deflection for a more sinister operation that involves mind control, politicians, the CIA, US military, doctors, entertainers, and the rich elite. A link to his work, Programmed to Kill, is in the description. As you'll remember from the last video, one of MKUltra's goals was to induce dissociative states and use those states to encode programming. Anyone familiar with true crime should notice the strings that run throughout the childhoods and early lives of most prolific killers. Their pasts, down to their methodologies and supposed motives, run parallel to one another. Whether these killers were directly involved with the military or not, there is usually a family connection to the government in some form. Gary Heidnick was a murderer whose crimes are too graphic to repeat. He was severely abused by his parents and suffered a traumatic brain injury as a child. His father encouraged him to drop out of high school and enlist in the U.S. Army. When he left the Army, he went on to found his own religious organization or cult, the United Church of the Ministers of God, where he perfected how to manipulate others. He took his army disability check and opened an account in the name of the church to avoid paying taxes. His church, even though he only had 50 members, went on to make at least half a million dollars. Heidnick's lawyer said, I found that my client was a guinea pig for the U.S. Army, and it will be proven beyond any doubt. Army and Veterans Administration documents show Heidnick was the subject of LSD tests between 1961 and 1963. The Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, had an IQ of 167 at the age of 5. By 16, he was earning an undergraduate degree at Harvard University while being used as a subject of MKUltra. He was among 22 students who were research subjects in the ethically questionable experiments conducted by Harvard University psychologist Henry Murray from late 1959 to early 1962. Murray was a former lieutenant colonel with the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, during World War II, which, as discussed in the last video, became the CIA after the war. Then there's Henry Lee Lucas, born one of nine children to alcoholic parents, who spent his early years in and out of prison and mental hospitals. Though his brother joined the Navy, Lucas was not involved in the military. However, he recalled being trained by a cult named Hand of Death in the Art of Killing. 
In the book, The Hand of Death, the Henry Lee Lucas story, he claims the cult's members varied. Some were socially prominent and also included high-level politicians. He claimed to be a contract killer and an abductor of children whom he delivered to a ranch in Mexico near Juarez. Once there, they were used in the production of child pornography and for ritual sacrifices. Henry said that the cult's operations were based in Texas and included trafficking children and drugs, among other illegal activities. What Henry ended up claiming was that what appeared to be the random works of a serial killer were in fact a planned series of crimes often committed for specific purposes. The Lone Killer just debunked the Lone Killer theory. The cult allegedly called itself the Hand of Death based on the occult rite of the Hand of Glory. In the occult, the Hand of Glory is a severed and dried human left hand. It has many symbolic meanings and uses. In ancient Ireland, the fingers were used as candles during ceremonies. Allegedly, the smell alone induced dissociation. Books describing the ancient occult practice of the Hand of Glory in Ireland go back to 1830. Baring Gold's book, Curious Myths of the Middle Ages, describes the recipe for using the Hand of Glory as a gruesome lantern during witchcraft in the Middle Ages. Lucas spent ten years in prison with four and a half of those years in a mental ward before his murder spree. During that time, he received intense drug and electroshock treatments. He would later describe this period of incarceration as a nightmare that would not end. He complained chronically about hearing voices in his head, taunting him day and night. Lucas befriended Otis Toole, a confessed cannibal and convicted serial killer. Lucas met up with Toole in Florida after he was inexplicably released from a Texas prison where he was serving time for the murder of his own mother. The pair allegedly then went on a spree of 100 to 120 murders, although law enforcement called some of those murders false confessions. Lucas was eventually convicted of 11 murders. Toole's mother abused him, including dressing him in girls' clothing and calling him Becky. As a young child, Toole was a victim of incest at the hands of many close relatives, including his older sister and next-door neighbor. His maternal grandmother was a Satanist who exposed him to various Satanic practices and rituals in his childhood, including self-mutilation and grave robbing, and dubbed him Devil's Child. In 1998, three days before Lucas was scheduled to be executed in Texas, then-Governor George W. Bush, infamous for refusing to grant stays of execution to any death row inmate, did something he had never done before or since, commuted his sentence from the electric chair to life in prison. George Bush had executed more people as governor of Texas than any other governor. On June 18, just 12 days before Lucas's scheduled execution, Governor Bush asked the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, whose members are appointed by Bush himself, to review his case. Strangely enough, Eight days later, the board uncharacteristically stated that Lucas's execution should not take place. Lucas became the first and the only recipient of Governor Bush's compassionate conservatism. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, had political connections as well as organized crime connections. He claimed to be the cousin of local mob figure Tony Accardo and that he was an aide to Chicago Mayor Richard Daley as well as being on friendly terms with Illinois' Attorney General William Scott. He once had his picture taken with First Lady Rosalind Carter, the image assigned to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. In the photo, Gacy is wearing a Secret Service S lapel pin, indicating that he had high-level security clearance. Gacy had little knowledge of the crimes to which he confessed, including the method of death. There were also many discrepancies found between the location of bodies on his property and where he recalled burying them. He was able to recall vague details of only five of his murders. He had no memory at all of the other 28. The total number of bodies found was 33. He continued to maintain that at least 28 of the murders had been committed by employees who had keys to his house. Gacy had hired handyman Robin Gecht to work as a subcontractor at least once. Gecht, it turns out, was the leader of the Chicago Ripper crew. What are the odds these two would somehow be connected? Where do you find a cannibal handyman? Craigslist? A more plausible explanation is that there is a network of people who are all associated with one another. 
Another serial killer, Dean Coral, who killed nearly 30 boys in the 1970s, was also part of the same child sex trafficking network as Gacy. Coral was known as the Candyman, since his family owned a candy store and he regularly gave boys candy. Coral was in the United States Army in 1964 and was ultimately assigned to Fort Hood in Texas. One of Coral's accomplices, Elmer Henley Jr., stated he was lured in and groomed by Coral before being told he belonged to an organization that sold boys into a sexual slavery ring operating from Dallas. Henley was offered $200 for every boy he brought to Coral. This statement was corroborated by another accomplice, David Brooks. Again, Dean Coral was not a single random madman, but part of a larger trafficking organization that was formed in Dallas, Texas by John D. Norman that later went nationwide. Gacy was also associated with John Norman's child trafficking network that began in Dallas in the mid-60s. Norman then started another network in San Diego, the Conquest Agency. Norman worked to create a nationwide network that operated as the Norman Foundation and Epic International. He was also part of the European trafficking ring, the Guyon Society. Norman was first arrested in Texas, and police seized 30,000 index cards with contacts which included names of the victims and customers of his networks. The Dallas Police Department sent the index cards to the U.S. State Department, where the 30,000 cards, which included the names of politicians, clergy, and millionaires, were promptly destroyed. Norman jumped a bail, fled Texas, and went to Chicago, where he formed the Delta Project, which expanded his network. He was arrested by Chicago police in 1973 and only served a four-year sentence. While serving his sentence, Norman's accomplice, Philip Pask, was wanted for questioning in the murder of a young boy who was going to testify against Norman in an upcoming trial. The connection with Gacy is in these checks that the police recovered, showing that Philip Paskey was paid several times by Gacy's construction company. This is a common way to hide payments for illegal activities. Norman's ring remained active in Dallas, Los Angeles, and Chicago. The U.S. Senate held a hearing from May 27 through June 16, 1977, detailing Norman's network and found that the Delta Project was still running, even though Norman was in jail. Once released, he went to Pennsylvania, where he was arrested again for the same charges of human trafficking in 1984 but skipped bail again and ran back to Illinois, where he was arrested again and only given an 18-month sentence. He died in 2008 at the age of 82, with no indication he ever stopped running his network. John Norman was a trafficking kingpin that connects to John Wayne Gacy and Dean Coral. Norman was the mid-century Jeff Epstein. Then there's the late 1980s Arthur Shawcross case, where he claimed to take on an alternate personality named Bessie when he murdered victims. Arthur Shawcross was one of the subjects of the military-funded project known as the Phoenix Program, which we'll discuss later. One of the brains behind the program was the military intelligence officer, Michael Aquino, who specialized in psychological warfare. Aquino also happens to be a member of Anton LaVey's Church of Satan. He eventually broke off to form his own sect, the Temple of Set. Something important I want to note is the classic denial by the psychiatric community of dissociative amnesia and the presence of alternate personalities. Renowned forensic psychiatrist Dr. Park Dietz, who consulted for both the FBI and CIA, dismisses Lewis's diagnosis and testified under oath during Shawcross's trial that he felt Lewis was inviting Shawcross to play various roles, which in turn led him to make up Bessie. He also told the producers of Crazy, Not Insane he believed multiple personality disorder is a hoax. The most prominent and influential psychologists are trained by the CIA to deny DID and RA in order to provide cover for their operations. The false memory syndrome was invented by these psychologists to explain away too many documented patterns and instead blames the victim. The web of lies runs wide and deep. Although false memory psychologists point to therapy sessions as the setting in which people commonly determine that they forgot and then remembered abuse, Elliot found that the majority of people who had forgotten a traumatic event and then remembered it identified the trigger as some form of media presentation, such as a film or a television show. Psychotherapy was the least common trigger for remembering trauma. Studies have shown that your brain is able to make up memories. 
Adults got convinced that as children they were lost in a mall, even though it did not happen to them. After that study ended, subjects were convinced they had experienced being lost in a mall. The researchers, however, were unable to convince subjects of experiences they had no mental reference for, like going diving in a cave as a child if the subject has never been diving. What this means is yes, our brains can alter and make up memories, but only if you've had an experience your brain can reference. Everyone has been in a mall, everyone has been lost as a kid at some point. However, you don't have a mental reference of if you haven't been through it. Now, by the late 80s, programming was not unheard of, and someone who is consulted for the FBI and the CIA is certainly knowledgeable of those projects that we're discussing. Their official stance is denial and diffusion of responsibility. There's no way most of these people with ties to the dirty organizations can be so ignorant when the MK documents were declassified through a Freedom of Information Act request in 1977. That produced 20,000 documents and led to the Senate hearing later that same year. Remember who was on that committee? 47 years and nothing has been done about it. The CIA spent $26 million on LSD experiments in 54 institutions. There is no room for plausible deniability. This video only touches on a small handful, but the majority of notorious serial killers were bred, not born. The agencies created a perfect storm and released programmed assassins, all of which had ties in some way or another to intelligence agencies and satanic or cult undertones. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam killer, son of Sam, 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 joined the U.S. Army at age 18 in 1971. Berkowitz began to claim he joined a cult in the spring of 1975. Maury Terry documents his cult involvement in the book *The Ultimate Evil*. A link to this book is in the description below. I did not pull the trigger at every single one of them. Berkowitz claimed his accomplices were fellow members of the 22 Disciples of Hell Satanic Cult, a group he joined when he was 22. And the killings were sacrifices to their satanic gods. Of course, everyone had played a role as far as the, the chanting and the praying. Everyone had had a role in that and, and understanding that, you know, this was going to be another uh, sacrifice to our gods, a bunch of scumbags that they were, <laughs> our gods, Lucifer and his crew, and we said, yeah, this is going to be another one for you, you know what I said. In 1993, Berkowitz claimed in a televised interview with Terry that he had been a member of a violent satanic cult that had orchestrated the murders as part of a ritual sacrifice. In an interview, Berkowitz said, I had gone to a party in the neighborhood, and I met some interesting people there. Interesting, Berkowitz claimed, because they were into Satanism. We began to talk about the occult. It just came up. He said he would go with the group to a park in Yonkers, Untermeyer Park. And there'd be people getting high and going through some rituals. They were into the occult. I met some people there who said they were witches. There were animal sacrifices and other dark and ugly things happening. He said he got caught up in the rituals. The group, he said, began to take over his very soul. It was a recruitment process. A slow but methodical recruitment process. But Berkowitz said it was about more than animal sacrifice. They were into child pornography, and there was other people there into that thing. You know, where they wanted that. And they would provide that. Producing CP? Is that what you're saying? And providing children? Yeah. Some members of the group, according to Berkowitz, were plotting ritualistic murder, human sacrifices to the devil, which is what this born-again Christian was now saying the son of Sam killings were all about. They were working with Satan to try to bring in a lot of chaos. Untermeyer Park in Yonkers is the same place Berkowitz said the group he ran with was centered and frequently held gatherings in the park. We've discussed how Samuel Untermeyer funded Cyrus Schofield in my video, The Antichrist Investigation. A more recent example of government connections in the family would be the April 15, 2013 Boston Bomb brothers. Their uncle worked as a consultant for the Agency for International Development, or the USAID, a U.S. government agency often used for cover by agents of the CIA in the former Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan in the early 1990s. The eldest brother, Tamerlan Zayev, was married to Catherine Russell, daughter of Yale graduate Dr. Warren King Russell II, who was a member of Skull and Bones Secret Society. 
Anthony Sutton's book called America's Secret Establishment and Introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones, Richard Warren Russell is listed as one of the 15 annual Skull and Bones initiates for the year 1951. His obituary lists him as being a member of counterintelligence for the U.S. Army after graduating from Yale. Back to the bombers. The eldest brother, Tamerlan, was killed in a police shootout on April 19th, and he allegedly had mentioned to several people that he had begun hearing voices. He was torn between those two people. Donald Larkin, 67, who attended mosque with Tamerlan for two years, told The Globe. He said that several times, and he did not like it. The Globe reports that Tamerlan's descent into radical Islam seems to track with him reporting hearing voices, and believing that he was under mind control. He believed in majestic mind control which is a way of breaking down a person and creating an alternative personality with which they must coexist, Larkin said. You can give a signal, a phrase, or a gesture and bring out the alternate personality and make them do things. Tamerlan thought someone might have done that to him. Tamerlan made comments to his mother about having two people in his head as early as 2008. She admitted to a family friend. Max, another family friend who was a urologist, told The Globe that when he heard about Tamerlan's admission, he concluded that he likely suffered from schizophrenia. Despite his advice, Tamerlan's parents never sought mental health treatment for him. Here we have an example of ignorance about mental health, and people paying the price for it. Dissociative disorders are the only disorders with multiple personalities. Hearing voices, as is the case with schizophrenia, has nothing to do with multiple personalities. Dissociative disorders are 100% preventable. They're a symptom of trauma and abuse often at an early age. DID and other dissociative disorders like DDNOS or CPTSD have distinct markers that separate them from all other disorders already in the DSM. It's conclusive that DID specifically results from long-term childhood trauma, nothing else. We will take a much closer look at dissociative disorders in the next part of the series. Someone with DID hears the voices inside their head, in contrast to the schizophrenic, which can hear them from outside of themselves. Tamerlan is not an isolated event. This pattern was demonstrated in another case that occurred just five months after the bombings. Military contractor Aaron Alexis went on a rampage at the Washington Navy Yard in the U.S. Capitol that killed a dozen people. Ultra-low frequency attack is what I've been subject to for the last three months, Alexis wrote in a message obtained by investigators after the incident. And to be perfectly honest, that is what has driven me to this. Alexis's family members later told reporters that he was also believed to be suffering from schizophrenia but unlike Sarnev, had sought treatment. As for Tamerlan's younger brother, Zokar, his friend witnessed his change of accent and overall demeanor at his trial. There's a lot to this case and many, many more, but this isn't about FFs and drills and all that goes with that. But again, here are more examples of the same formula, symptoms of mind control, murders, and ties to the government. One of the connections that can definitely be made between mind control, the CIA, and specific serial killers is a man named Louis Jolion Jolly West. At 17, West joined the U.S. Army. Later, he earned a degree in psychiatry. In 1948, he had transferred to the U.S. Air Force Medical Corps, and in 1952, he was appointed as chief of the psychiatry service at the Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. Later, West headed up the psychiatry department at UCLA and the school's renowned Neuroscience Center until his retirement in 1988. One day, among a batch of research papers on hypnosis in West's archives there, I found letters between West and his CIA handler, Sherman Grifford. The cover name, according to John Marks, the search for the Manchurian candidate, for Sidney Gottlieb. West, who had once written to a magazine editor that he had never worked for the CIA, had in fact worked closely with the agency's black sorcerer himself. Let's stop here for a minute and give you a little history on the black sorcerer Dr. West worked with. According to Stephen Kinzer, author of the book Poisoner in Chief, the visionary chemist Sidney Gottlieb was the CIA's master magician and gentle-hearted torturer, the agency's Poisoner in Chief. As head of the MK Ultra Mind Control Project, he directed brutal experiments at secret prisons on three continents. His experiments spread LSD across the United States, making him a hidden godfather of the 1960s counterculture, 
For years, he was the chief supplier of spy tools used by CIA officers around the world. Late in the fall of 1966, West arrived in San Francisco to study hippies and LSD. When he arrived in Haight-Ashbury, West was the only scientist in the world who had predicted the emergence of potentially violent LSD cults such as Charles Manson's family. It's easy to predict something will happen if you're the one who's going to make it happen. The person Sidney Gottlieb put in charge of the LSD programs in San Francisco was Louis Jolly West. In the height, West arranged for the use of a crumbling Victorian house on Frederick Street, where he set up what he described as a laboratory disguised as a hippie crash pad. The pad opened in June 1967, at the dawn of the Summer of Love. The CIA also set up a free medical clinic in the neighborhood under the pretense of giving them free medical care, but with the covert goal of examining them and using them as test subjects. The Manson family regularly came through this clinic, and another psychiatrist who worked on mind control experiments with West even embedded himself in the cult for several months. West was deeply connected with the Manson case, but was strangely absent from the trials. In 2019, a news article questions whether a CIA secret LSD lab turned Manson into a killer. The article says that the answer could be in Manson's lost year in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco, California, a year largely overlooked in the endless dissection of Manson's crimes, where during the 1967 Summer of Love, he began to drop acid and form his cult. That's the exact answer. Charles Manson was programmed by Dr. Jolly West in San Francisco, who was working with Dr. Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA. An alarming number of serial killers were unwilling participants of MKUltra and other secret government projects. Rather than the profile of a lone predator, we find controlled assassins and patsies conditioned and programmed by a variety of intelligence fronts including military entities, psychiatric institutions, and cults. McGowan, as previously mentioned, wrote, For anyone who doubts that the CIA or any other of the numerous interwoven intelligence agencies would be doing these things, it's important to remember that we are talking about the same agencies that, through operations like Paperclip, recruited some of the most twisted men from the Third Reich, such as Klaus Barbie and Joseph Villa. At this point, anyone who still believes the old disinfo campaign of if there were some nefarious reason for these killings, be it mind control or cult involvement, well, we'd all know about it. It's not armed with the facts. With so much evidence available now, it is not an option anymore to ignore this. It takes dedicated research, and you will never be told any of this from the mainstream media. They are in the business of covering it up for a reason. But all of the information that I have found is open source and accessible to anyone who cares enough to know the truth. Money and connections shape reality as far as the media is concerned. There is always more to a case than the public is aware of. I invite you to take a look at the way the Menendez brothers were torn to shreds by the media after recounting the horrific abuse they suffered at their parents' hands, and consider if the media is sympathetic to victims of abuse or to the abusers. We want justice. We want blood justice fast. No, uh, no indication of any kind that there was ever any abuse. Prosecutors say greed drove the boys to shooting their parents to death last August. Prolific murderers become the scapegoats for high-ranking officials who can't risk being directly involved in the more incriminating parts of their sinister mind game. One specific program called Clear Eyes outlines the formula of an intricately programmed assassin having an IQ level of 145 to 160 to be able to have this specific program. This is a sleeper assassin who is capable of being triggered or activated, then commit crimes as serious as murder and afterwards have no shame, guilt, or remorse. The public is often told the Clear Eye subject has had a deeply troubled and violent past. The media will present the Clear Eye subject with mental health issues who went on a tragic and senseless rampage. Once a Clear Eye is triggered, accidentally or on purpose, the subject is beyond recall. In other words, they cannot be stopped. 
A level 5 clear eyes can only be approached after they carry out their program or operation. In most cases of programmed clear eyes who commit murder or assassinations, the subject is killed at the location, either by law enforcement or by suicide programming. CP, in other words, child, and then a word that should never involve children, is a multi-billion dollar business in the U.S. alone. John Hollingsworth, the late author of the book Unspeakable Acts, said, quote, It's bigger than Disney. Much bigger. Disney is another front used to traffic CP. To make the obvious very clear, all children involved in CP are used children. The children victimized by the CP worldwide cult empire come from various places such as being born into families with cult connections or religious organizations involved, as well as orphanages and missing children. Ted Gunderson, former FBI station chief for Los Angeles, has stated, The FBI has an accurate count of the number of automobiles stolen every year. It knows the number of homicides, rapes, and robberies, but the FBI has no idea of the number of children that disappear every year. They simply do not ask for statistics. According to the National Institutes of Health, CSA, once thought to be rare, is nowadays accepted as a frequent reality that occurs across a range of cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds worldwide. Please read this quote from the European Psychiatry Association. The CIA is behind a blackmail operation in which child were used to honey trap and compromise politicians, military, top businessmen, and key officials. This fact made it into the news in 2019 during the vetting process for the new Secretary of Labor, Alexander Acosta. New allegations from the Daily Beast and journalist Vicki Ward reported that Acosta told the Trump administration during the screening process for his current role that he was asked to cut a deal with Epstein because he was told the financier belonged to intelligence, and that the issue was above his pay grade. Intelligence, in this case, could mean either CIA, MI6, Mossad, or any combination of the three. Let me be clear. Child trafficking is run as a single, integrated world operation. This operation is coordinated by the CIA and other foreign intelligence agencies think that's bad? But wait, there's more! We're going to talk about three more projects! The CIA uses drugs, hypnosis, torture, sleep deprivation, and even study darker ways to control their subjects. A sub-project of MKUltra, called MK Often, incorporated research into the occult and demonology after Dr. Stephen Aldrich took over the program from Dr. Sidney Gottlieb. Dr. Stephen Aldrich took over the leadership role, and ORD continued to probe for ways to control human behavior until 1979, and they were doing so with space-age technology that made the days of MKUltra look like the horse and buggy era. Creating a subservient society was not out of sight. Aldrich inaugurated Operation Often, which incorporated the occult and demonology. They searched for ways to use the paranormal in spying and counterintelligence. ORD sponsored work in parapsychology. Along with the military services, agency officials wanted to know whether psychics could read minds or control them from afar, telepathy, if they could gain information about distant places or people, clairvoyance or remote viewing, if they could predict the future, precognition, or influence the movement of physical objects or even the human mind. It was then expanded to study the effects of various drugs on animals and humans. According to author Gordon Thomas's 2007 book, Secrets and Lies, the CIA's Operation Often, was also initiated by the chief of the CIA's technical services branch, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, to explore the world of black magic and harness the forces of darkness and challenge the concept that the inner reaches of the mind are beyond reach. As part of Operation Often, Dr. Gottlieb and other CIA employees visited with and recruited fortune tellers, palm readers, clairvoyants, astrologers, mediums, psychics, specialists in demonology, witches and wizards, Satanists, other occult practitioners, and more. 
Throughout the 60s and 70s, various intentional acts of violence began to explode in the U.S. as a result of the hideous Phoenix Program, which was designed to use extreme shock to traumatize the Vietnamese people during the war into compliance. This project, along with MKUltra, was deliberately used to induce PTSD and CPTSD. One of the people who was terrorizing the Vietnamese was Arthur Shawcross, who was later let loose in the U.S. He was one of their victims who was used to victimize others. The Phoenix program was halted and the scientists continued their work under a new name, first Phoenix 2, before calling it the Montauk Project. It was run covertly by the military with private funding since Congress had put a stop to the Phoenix Project. Stranger Things is based on a mix of MKUltra, Project Stargate, and the Montauk Project at Camp Hero. The Montauk Project, formerly called Phoenix 2 Project, was, according to some, an extension of Project Rainbow, and the Philadelphia experiment that ran from 1970 to 1983. These experiments involved mind control, genetic manipulation, weapons research, weather manipulation, and various other electromagnetic experiments. The project took place at Camp Hero Air Force Base on Montauk, Long Island. Let's look at one last example of what was produced by this project. The Columbine case of Eric Harris and Dylan Cleveland was carried out April 20th of 1999. The days falling on the week of April 20th are significant dates to occultists and are associated with the pagan worship of Baal and fire sacrifice. The McVeigh, Oklahoma City bombings were carried out April 19th of 1995. The Waco massacre on April 19th of 1993. The list goes on. While there are countless discrepancies between the official narrative and what really happened at Columbine, signs indicate that Eric was a victim of mind control programming. Now remember, this took place in 1999. An archive of a transcript from the basement tapes, which are videos Eric and Dylan made regarding their motives and thought process, were destroyed in 2011. An archived newspaper from 1999 has a headline that states, Columbine cares envision hijacking and crashing plane. But hang on, there's another detail. Eric and Dylan wanted to hijack a plane and crash it into New York City. Again, this was in 1999. Eric Harris's father retired from the Air Force as a lifelong career officer where he had been involved in covert intelligence programs for over 20 years and moved the family to Littleton, Colorado in 1996, just three years before the disaster. Many residents in Littleton are employed by Lockheed Martin, the largest defense contractor in the world, and a front company for military intelligence black projects. Lockheed Martin owns a company called Access Graphics in Boulder, Colorado, which was being run by John Ramsey, the father of Sean Benet, at the time of his daughter's death. Prior to moving to Littleton, Colorado, the Harris family was living at Plattsburgh Air Force Base in New York State. The Stewart Air Force Base in New York was in between Plattsburgh and Montauk. Long Island's Montauk Air Force Station and nearby Brookhaven National Labs have been implicated as facilities carrying out mind control, among sites we will discuss in the next video. Eric Harris was essentially one of the mind-controlled Montauk boys coming out of Camp Hero. There are indications that the 1960s Plattsburgh Air Force Base was linked to Ewan Cameron, president of the American Psychiatric Association, the Canada Psychiatric Association, and the World Psychiatric Association. He also had ties to the CIA. NSA, and other malevolent factions of intelligence agencies, not to mention his massive abuses in the MKUltra project just over the border in Montreal. You'll remember we discussed him in the previous video. Reports indicate that this legacy continued at Plattsburgh through the 70s and beyond, with electromagnetic and radio frequency and mind control activities tied to some of the experimentation at Montauk. Those involved with the military, Air Force, Navy, etc., often program their children because of the following. There's easy access to the child. The family can reside on the base if needed. The necessary technology is available and the environment is controlled. Some of the government names for alien programs are MyLabs, Project Mannequin, and the Montauk Project. MyLab is a military operation carried out to convince the targets of the operation that they have had an encounter with extraterrestrial beings, which is actually a staged ploy. DARPA is the organization that directs the MyLab projects. Research in this area started in 1924. My labs can include classic alien abduction types of experiences, occult ritual and cult abuse elements, dissociation, PTSD, DID, political manipulation, medical experimentation, interrogations, time manipulation, transportation, alternate locations such as underground military installations. An example would be the numerous underground bases in Oregon. 
My lab programming typically takes place underground. Here's a list of some underground bases. Alien programming involves staged abductions by people dressed up as aliens. For example, they will dress like Greys, Sasani, Pleiadians, Zetareticulans, or Anakim, among others. The person who is abducted is drugged prior to abduction. Bright lights may be used, as well as medical instruments, and this may take place in a stark room. Essentially, this is SRA, but demons have been replaced with aliens, and ritual space has been replaced with a sterile examination room. That's all I'm going to get into my labs for the moment. If you're interested, I suggest starting with researching my lab programming and the Orion project. Just remember that this field is riddled with disinformation, so use your discernment and think logically. What we know to be factual is that MKUltra and many sub-projects happened, and trauma-based mind control continues to happen. We know the children have been trauma-programmed. We know the government lies. And experiments on civilians. Quote, the key to creating an effective spy or assassin rests in splitting a man's personality or creating multipersonality with the aid of hypnotism. This is not science fiction. This has and is being done. I have done it. Dr. G. H. S. Brooks is quoted in a 1968 article in the Providence Evening Bulletin. I highly suggest looking into 32nd Degree Knights Templar Estabrooks, who wrote this book, Spiritism and Hypnotism, in the early mid 1950s. You can also do a search on Dr. Thomas Narut. The carefully crafted folklore around government activities has made it very difficult to get to the truth. The lore around these topics hides the truth beneath a mountain of lies and ends up working as its own cover or smokescreen. The culture around something that they want hidden is created so that any truth discovered is dismissed outright or through effective conditioning entwined with the lies. Many serial killers and mass shooters we see in our recent history share the telltale signs of an MKUltra assassin. The American folklore, the myths, the smoke screens of the serial killer hides a much bigger, fearsome, and marauding monster. Governments. One drawback with a number of the government's programs was that the subjects were adults. Thus, their minds were more difficult to manipulate. As a result, this led to programming practices on infants and children. One project we have yet to mention is the subject of the next part in this series, The Monarch Project. As always, thank you for watching this video. I'll see you again soon.